<laughs> Welcome to the 2020 Awards Podcast. Today we're going to be looking back at Groundhog Day. Rita, I'm reliving the same day over and over. Groundhog Day. Today. Okay, I'm waiting for the punchline. No. Really. This is the third time. It's like yesterday never happened. I am racking my brain, but I can't even begin to imagine why you'd make up something like this. I'm not making it up. I am asking you for help. Okay, what do you want me to do? I don't know. You're a producer. Come up with something. Once again, we are joined by filmmaker and author Brian McDonald. Brian has written several books on storytelling, including Invisible Ink, The Golden Theme, and most recently, Ink Spots, which is a compilation of essays from his Invisible Ink blog. And uh, if you haven't checked that out yet, I highly suggest you do. Lots of great insight there. Welcome back, Brian. Hey, thanks. Um, So for those of you who don't watch Groundhog Day every year on Groundhog's Day like I do, uh, it's basically the story of a self-absorbed weatherman played by Bill Murray who thinks he's above it all. He's sent to Puxatawney to cover the annual Groundhog Day ceremony, and despite his prediction for clear skies, he gets snowed in and can't leave Punxsutawney and is forced to spend an extra night. Uh, For some unexplained reason, when he wakes up the next morning, it's still Groundhog's Day, and that's pretty much the entire movie. Uh, He has to keep reliving the same day over and over and over in an endless loop until eventually he, quote-unquote, gets it right. So... um, you have seen this film before, as I recall. I have. Yes. <laughs> and um, I've seen this movie, I don't know, a dozen times. I, I do watch it. I do try to like watch this every year on, on Groundhog's Day. Yeah. I love this movie. It's a good movie. Um, what was your initial reaction to it? When I first saw it? or Yeah. yeah. Uh, I really, really liked it. I was yeah. surprised by it. I didn't see it in the theater. Oh, you didn't? So, no. So oh. I saw it on uh, on the, the cable television and yeah. uh, was really liked it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think? I mean, this movie does have huge appeal. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think that is? Well, you know, it has a... A lot of movies now have gimmicks, you know, the, the and um, so they'll rely on the gimmick. And a lot of times now they would rely on this, it's the same day gimmick, right? And people think that's what makes it good. But that's exactly what could make it bad. Seeing the same day over and over and over again. It's the execution, right? So the execution, um, there's a reason this is happening to Bill Murray's character. And the reason is he needs it to happen to become a better person. Right, And that first act establishes what kind of person he is and exactly how he needs to change, essentially. Um, And I think that that first act becomes the foundation that makes the rest of it work. Without that, it is just a gimmick. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a brilliant concept. But it is is something that, like, could very easily be just the most boring movie in the world to watch. If it weren't executed well, people would think it was a terrible concept. Yeah. And it's also one of those movies, I think, that people... I think it's such an easy idea, and it's one of those great examples of like something that's so simplistic that it's really complicated. Yeah, <laughs> you know, in the yeah. sense that like to, I mean, because there's a million ways you can screw this thing up. Well, it reminds me, uh, in a way, of Hook. <laughs> Hook is not a good movie. What? Yeah. <laughs> But people think Hook is a bad idea for a movie because it's so poorly executed. Right. Right? Yeah. It's actually a good idea for a movie. Like, Peter Pan doesn't want to grow up. What happens when he grows up? What yeah. happens, right? Yeah. That's actually a good idea. Yeah. But it's ter- it's terribly executed. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think this could have fallen into that category really easily. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Watching it this last time, I was... It, 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 dawned on me like what a zen exercise this movie is like it wasn't until this you know having seen it now oh really it was like oh my god this is like one of the most zen it's a movies i've ever seen it's completely a buddhist movie yeah like yeah it it it, um you know it's funny because i wrote a script with reincarnation in it right so i did a lot of reincarnation research yeah and the theory behind reincarnation is that you keep reliving the same, you know, lives until you get it right and then yeah. you move on. And that's yeah. exactly what happens here. And in fact, what allows him to move on, uh, the, uh, the, the woman he's in love with, um, Rita, the character Rita, says to Bill Murray that he only thinks about himself, which is true. Right. 
And on that first day, one of the first things that happens on the street is he passes a homeless guy. Right. And he kind of feigns like he's looking for money, but he's not really <laughs> looking for money. And then he kind of moves on. And that, that character, that homeless guy, is the key. That's the way out. Yeah. Right? The right. second he starts thinking about other people and not himself, and in fact, not even going after after Rita anymore. Mm-hmm. When he's just trying to save this, this character's life, he's like, this old man died. When he changes, then he moves on to a higher level. It's very, right. very Buddhist. Right. He keeps getting re- reincarnated every day. Well, it's like when he accepts his fate of living this day over and over again, he's not trying to impress anybody or show off. He's just trying to be a better person. Yeah. 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 It's really nice. Well, it's funny because I was, I was thinking about the movie because it, it has... There's probably probably more stages in here than I'm, than than I'm remembering, but there's the first day that it happens. Mm-hmm. Well, there's the first day, there's which the first is, actual which is, day, yeah, which right. is like an actual day that's not a, a reincarnated day, but um, and it's just him being an mm-hmm. and he's an to everybody. Mm-hmm. And then the second day, there's the confusion as to like, wait, what's going on? I thought yesterday was Groundhog's Day. Am I crazy? Right. And then it slowly progresses into uh, where where he's like starts to experiment and mm-hmm. like tries to like he steals from the the bank truck. Mm-hmm. Um, and it becomes like he starts to test the boundaries of this world. How much can he get away with? And he then, tries to kill himself. Well, then eventually he tries to yeah. kill himself, and then he sees himself as a god. Right. And then it isn't until Rita says to him, like he's explaining it to her one day, he's explaining it to her, and then he goes, uh, what does he say? Oh, she says to him, like, well, you shouldn't look at this as a curse. Right. And and Bill Murray's great in that moment where he's like, gosh, you're an optimistic person. <laughs> 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 or a happy person or whatever he says. But it isn't, and that's when he starts to have the change and he starts to like, he starts taking piano lessons. He starts to teach himself things that are for his own benefit of learning as opposed to, like, earlier in the movie, he's kind of trying to, like, he's learning French in order to seduce Rita. And he's he's teaching him all these things to, like, get somewhere with somebody else, to basically con somebody. And it isn't until he starts teaching himself these things just for the enlightenment of, of being himself. And then he finally accepts himself and accepts this, like torture that he's or you know this world that he's in that he finally is able to get free himself of it so well there's also you know you see that you know the whole time he's trying to to essentially get Rita into bed that's essentially what he's doing and so he spends a lot of time trying to do that and what what's interesting is he sort of stops trying to do that and he just has a really good day with her yeah and when he has the really good day with her and he wakes up the next day she's she's not there right in his bed they don't they sleep in the same bed but they don't sleep together right um, and he wakes up and she's gone. That's actually when he starts to change. When he when he just had a good day, yeah. where he didn't have yeah. an agenda other than hanging out with her. Right. Um, it was really nice. And then the next day, boom, he sees the he sees the homeless guy and he's he gives him money. In fact, he gives him all his money. Yeah. Right. Um, and he just keeps doing that. Um, I have a theory. Coincidentally, I don't mean to cut you off, but yeah, as we were coming in to do this podcast. A homeless gentleman asked us for money. Yeah. I didn't have any. Yeah. You didn't have any. Right. He asked for a beer. I didn't give him a beer because because I am way more the Bill Murray character at the beginning of this movie. You're before Bill? I'm before Bill. Or before Phil? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, so maybe I should go back out there. And- I don't know. That might be your way out. I, I generally. <laughs> How many times have you lived this podcast? <laughs> this is number nine. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> are, we, are we doing better or worse than. I don't know how yesterday. you guys are doing, but I feel like. Feel like you're nailing it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. next time will be better. Yeah. It's funny. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> There's no time. Uh, I will generally give people money if they ask me for it. Mm-hmm. Almost always. The exceptions are if I have to go through my pockets and pull out more money than I want to give them, and then I have to count it out. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, that's embarrassing. Yeah, yeah, that's embarrassing. Like, oh yeah, there's a five, but you can have the one. Then I won't do it. Yeah. You know, and you can't ask them for change. No, that's not. That's bad form. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and plus, they, they don't have change. Yeah. They Can you break it. a five? They might have it. They might. Yeah. They might have If they were it. smart, they wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> they just take that five. They have those coin things. <laughs> <laughs> they, they pull out the old credit card. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 cube, I just need a signal here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, you were making a point. <laughs> uh, was I? What was my point? I thought so. Um, well, we were talking about him finally having a good day, not having an agenda. Yeah, and just and just um, trying to be a good guy. Although there is one false note in that third act uh, that I that I that has always bugged me and really bugged me watching it, preparing for this podcast, and that is everything he's doing now is about being selfless. Like he's trying to save this old man from dying. He keeps you know it's bothering him that he can't save him. Right. He's doing all these things, but when he goes to the piano lesson, the teacher has a student there. And he kicks the student out. Oh, right. And she's like, why am I getting kicked out? And right. I thought, he's not that guy. Like, they should have... Oh, right. right. They should have found another reason that yeah. she didn't want to teach him. Like, yeah. well, I'm busy right now doing X, Y, or Z, but not with another student. Because right. now he looks selfish again. Right. Well, the, the thing that bothered me about the third act is, as an audience, we saw Phil growing and becoming a better person. But all Rita knows is the day before and the day after of Phil, and why does she fall in love with him and want to spend the rest of her life with him after one day? Well, I think that she she saw a selfless person. She lays out the kind of guy she... Right. Right? And she saw a guy who was completely selfless. Like when they, at one point, are having a toast, and uh, he says... Uh, uh, he buys her a drink. Shall we toast? And he's like, he's like, uh, to the groundhog because it's groundhog day. And she's disappointed. And she says, I always drink to world peace. <laughs> right, right, right. And then the next day, of course, to world peace. <laughs> to world peace. Yeah. Um, he becomes more the, her ideal. Um, I mean, that happens in a lot of these kinds of stories when the character, um, well, they hate each other at first and then they, well, not fall just in love. that, not just that they hate each other at first and fall in love, but that a character grows in some way that makes them worthy of love. Um, oh, exactly. Yeah. So I think that that pattern makes sense to our brain. The day doesn't matter that it was a day. I think that pattern makes sense to our, to our right. No. Yeah. And until I watched it this time, I was like, well, wait a minute. Rita hasn't had the same experience I've had with Phil growing as a person. She just knew in the morning the night before he was a real <laughs> and the next day he was a good guy right but it seems to me that it was that she had no like oh I don't know this guy maybe I misread this guy exactly that's what yeah. it seemed more but like but then you're me. still going to fall in love with this guy in one day and like it seemed like at the end they were going to spend the rest of their lives together well, they could it's oh. happened I, there's no sequel yet, so <laughs> yeah. maybe. No, but the I mean, I, I, will be I, just the same. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, there's, there are definitely people that you know you meet throughout life that you just go like, "This person is awesome." The instant you meet them, you're just like, "This is an incredible human being." Like when I, you met me, exactly. Where you're just like, "I just want to hang out with this person." So I don't know that she's in love with him, but certainly enamored. She's yeah. certainly enamored and willing to like you know fall so far. Yeah, with him, and they they. You know, they don't consummate the relationship in that scene, so. Um, and it doesn't take very that. long to get enamored with a person. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. It doesn't take very long. Yeah. It's interesting. When I was researching this, I uh, I found something on Wiki that said, isn't that sad? I just said that. Don't when I was not. researching this, meaning I went to Wikipedia. <laughs> God. No, you didn't use the Dewey Decimal no. System. You didn't, go, yeah, you didn't go get an encyclopedia. <laughs> I, just, I, just did, I just admitted how lazy I am. But so when I was when I was when I was researching this, um, they had there was something on there about how how long was Phil stuck in this time loop, and you know there's there's they never answer that right um but they think it was 10,000 years mm -hmm. and they said wow. that because they said like and it makes sense because like to master the piano the, it to takes like 10, to become hours. yeah to to you know um you know the ice sculpt all the stuff he can do by right. the end of the movie it's like oh okay that makes sense and, it, and they actually said at one point they thought as a as a calendar he would go into the library and read one page each day and that's how he would keep track of Oh, how time. many days? And that by the end of the movie, he allegedly would have read the entire library. Mm -hmm. So, but it kind of makes sense. Interesting, though. It's a long time. Yeah. yeah. I think I would kill myself. 
But he, he tried. <laughs> <laughs> um, no can do. Yeah. It's funny. You mentioned the piano. There was That was the one other false note I found in the film was... At the end of the at the big at the big dance. By the way, it's interesting that the false notes are around the piano. Yes, <laughs> I know. Um, at the big dance, mm-hmm. at the end, or whatever the hell you want to call it, at the ceremony at the end of the night, um, he's playing piano, and his piano teacher nudges Andy McDowell and goes, "That's my student." But it's like, wait. Would he still be taking lessons from her at this point? Right. Well, it so. seems like he still goes every day. Because on the last day, he kicks the girl out. But. Yeah, no, no, no. Really, that was the first. That was, that was first, the first that, day. That was first day. Yeah, the girl yeah. Out. And he probably so, does that every day. No, he day. kicks the girl out the first day. Every day he kicks the girl. Well, every day he right, kicks yeah. the girl out. But like once you've mastered the, the piano, piano, are you going to keep going? going to, yeah. Or are you going to spend that time doing something? Yeah, but he's something else. Well, I guess he doesn't because he goes back every day for ten thousand <laughs> years. I think yeah. that sometimes they sacrifice their story for the joke. Yeah, and that's why the girl get, gets kicked out. Yeah, it'll be funny. Yeah, and it's like well, it might be funny, but it's false. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess he could just go an hour later for his piano lesson after 10,000 years. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. He, he could wait. do something else. Yeah. 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 Another page. Yeah. He's got, he's he got other stuff. He's got life. time. Yeah. He's yeah. got time. Yeah. Yeah. He's got time. Yeah. Today's podcast is sponsored by Hilliard's Beer. Brewed and canned in Seattle's Ballard neighborhood, but drunk everywhere. Visit their tap room Thursday through Sunday. You can get more info from them at hilliardsbeer.com. And honest tea. Nature made it right. We put it in a bottle. Refreshingly honest. Honest tea. Visit honesttea.com to find a distributor near you. Phil? Phil Connors? I thought it was you. Ned Ryerson. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have missed you so much. I don't know where you're headed, but can you call in sick? Uh, <laughs> I gotta get going. Uh, <laughs> it's good to see you, Phil. Is there anything from this movie that you think you might be nominating this year? Probably the screenplay. Yeah. Yeah, probably the screenplay and... Uh, Bill Murray is is great in it. I feel like this is the... F- I might be wrong, but I seem to remember this is kind of the first time people went, oh, Bill Murray can actually act. Oh, He's so not just, like, the goofy, funny guy. And he does play a lot of that in well, this. Well, he did. He played Hunter S. Thompson in that movie before. Didn't... Like, years before oh, this Oh, that's came right. Out. Where the Buffalo well, the, Yeah, with the Buffalo yeah. And then he was in... Um, but did anybody see that? Yeah, he was in The Razor's Edge. That was the first time he was in a serious movie. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah but, if I had 10,000 kind of years, I would go back up, and watch those. Like, he kind of gave up trying to be serious because nobody took him seriously. Yeah. And then he just until, made a movie where he's serious, right? Where he's FDR. FDR. Well, until Lost in Translation. Oh, right. That kind of was yeah. his big comeback. Like, oh, this guy's legit for real. Right. right. Yeah. But, yeah, I thought he was great in this. He was. I thought. I mean, there's a. It's a comedic role, but there's a lot of there's a lot of depth to it. I think. Well, it's a great part because you you see you get to see his character change, you know, every day. Yeah. Which is you know a lot of like if you look back at like a, a Rain Man or something, there's there's no character development in, in right. that part as opposed to you know this is all character development. It's yeah. great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, a fun fact during the. Direct, the director, Harold Ramis, said um, most of the times when he tried to explain a scene to Bill Murphy, uh, Bill Murray, Bill Murray, Bill would just ask. I didn't know Bill J- Murphy was in the movie. Bill Murphy? Yeah. I he's he's in it, too. Uh, <laughs> he's it's, also it's, Bill, it's Bill Murray's stand-in. Oh, okay. Bill Murphy. <laughs> yeah, okay. So Bill Murray, um, he would just ask Harold Ramis, just tell me, good Phil or bad Phil? Oh, really? <laughs> that was, just tell me, good or bad. Interesting. Oh, yeah. Do you, you know, still want to nominate him for Best Actor? Yeah. No, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. No. That's evil. <laughs> you don't that's think terrible. so? No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was great. Um, oh, that, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Uh, before I go on with uh, the question you actually asked, that reminded me of this, the idea of why this is happening to him and how it's happening. And I know that they had this screenwriter, um, what's his name? Uh, R- R- Danny, Danny Rubin. Rubin. Yeah. Uh, they had him write in a gypsy curse. Oh, the right. The studio had right. him write in a gypsy yeah. curse so it would explain how this is happening. But it's interesting. Audiences don't care. No. Yeah. They, they know why it's happening, 
this guy's a jerk and he needs to change. It, the Twilight Zone is built on this idea, right? That this idea of of knowing why they don't care how how does it make any difference? It's just some cosmic justice. Some I mean, is it, you accept it. Yeah, you accept it because it's well written, it's well directed, it's well played. Well, people understand um, how stories go, and they understand that the story. This is what's required for the story to happen. Right. right. They won't accept anything after that. They won't. You can't just do stuff. Right. Just because, oh, well, it's a magical world. So now we can do all kinds of magical things. Right. I'll give you one thing. All of a sudden he flies. Yeah. yeah. I'll give you one thing um, that is there for the story to happen, for the character to change or whatever. Um, but a lot of people focus on, I was talking about John Carter. Oh, how they yeah. on John Carter. I know they were very focused on how John Carter got to Mars. And I think that was the wrong thing to be focused on. I think should, they should have been focused on why. Why right. was he there? Why sure. did he need to go there as a character? What did he what did he need there? So, yeah. So Bill Murray, obviously. Right. Um, best screenplay. Yeah. Screenplay. Mm. You know, I bet you, uh, you know, editing is a hard thing to judge. But I was going to say editing. Yeah, editing is probably one of the things. But editing is so hard because you don't know sometimes where, right. the, where the editing came from. Was that in the script? Right. Was that, yeah. you know right. what I mean? But the mere fact that this story works at all oh, sure. means that not only is the script good, but the editing has to be there to kind of no, it's true. keep it going. Well, there, because it's nice where... where Sometimes you'll cut into a scene and you know it's the next day. So yeah. you'll right. see, right? Yeah. And it's really yeah. nice. Like, yeah. oh, w- yeah, the rest of the day has happened, but we're just here, back yeah. here again at this part right. of the day. Right, It's really nice. Yeah. And likewise, I mean, that goes right into best directing, I think. Mm-hmm. Because, again, I think to keep this thing moving, because this movie could be so boring. It really could. It could be the most boring well, movie in the well, world. Well, imagine but. as a director keeping track of where he is right. during his right. emotional you know, journey. Yeah. And I wonder how they shot it. Do you think they just had like, okay, today we're doing all the hallway scenes. I bet he, you they did. Oh, I'm sure they the did. Room. I bet yeah, you they did. Yeah. That's got to be tough. Yeah. I, yeah. And I have a theory about uh, Ned Ryerson. Yes, go on. I think, I think, Ned, I think that Ned Ryerson is, um, is sort of the guy making this happen. Really? Yeah. Because there's some... Oh, I, think, I think I know where you're going with Yeah, this. because Ned Ryerson is there always. He's right after the homeless guy. So he, get, he so Bill Murray passes the homeless guy and pretends like he feigns like I'm looking for money. Nah, whatever. And then the next, the very next step, almost he meets Ned Ryerson. And there's a, I think that I just get this feeling about it that Ned Ryerson is is sort of the oh yeah oh like he's the magic gypsy yeah like hmm. he's the the thing because of when he shows up and in fact when he's, both, he's Clarence yeah and when Bill Murray gets better is when he does that thing where he's pretending like he's hitting on. Uh, Ned Ryerson, and he hugs him and goes, I don't know what you're doing now, but maybe you can take a break. And, and <laughs> huh. When he's winning. It's when yeah, Bill yeah, Murray's yeah. winning yeah. Yeah. that he wins over Ned Ryerson. Right. It's kind of interesting. Oh, oh, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. And I was going to say, not that Stephen Tobolowsky, I oh, think, should be nominated so for good. Best Supporting Love. Actor, but he's great. <laughs> he's, he's good. And I'm, and I'm really glad that like he's actually found an audience now. Sure. Because he's, he's been in so many movies, and he's great in all of them, but he's always that guy. Oh, that guy. Oh, I mean, he did a guy. documentary about yeah. himself. Yeah. I know that guy yeah. here. Yeah. yeah, sure. So what I would nominate it for is Best Use of a Song. For Sonny and Cher, I Got You, Babe. Oh, That comes on every morning at 6 a.m. Of course, yeah. Yeah. And Annie McDowell, I think, she's not that good in this. Like, but she she works for the part. Right. You know? Right. Like, she doesn't blow me away. But, but like, there's something about her that, that totally is perfect for that role. Well, it's, it's, she's optimistic. Yeah. You know, you see her in the beginning, like, oh, playing with the weather gr- actually, yeah, actually, She's and great yeah. in that yeah. scene. And, and she never really gets... You know, we've all worked with talent, and one of my favorite lines is, did he just call himself talent? (laughs) And it's just, it's so perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she never really gets, like, whatever, you know. Yeah. This is, she is an optimistic, positive person, and her character, we weren't going to see any of those other characters change, because it's all a new day for them. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and and interestingly, I think, you know, uh, Sally Field talked about this when she, uh, sort of between really good parts... When earlier in her movie career, she said, I was playing a lot of the girl. 
and um, it's it's like it's sort of like you're just the girlfriend, you're just the you know, and you have to fill it in with your own personality. You have to you have to bring a lot to right. it, and I think that Annie McDowell had a lot of that to do. I think she was the girl. I think Bill Murray's character was much more uh, drawn out, and and in, in terms of um, uh, I don't know, drawn out is the word I'm looking for, but more drawn. Better drawn, better realized, mm-hmm. and um, probably because it's a, a male writer, and that's the way he. Sure, you know what I yeah. mean. Um, I don't think that she's a flat character, but I don't think she's as three dimensional as she might be. Right, that's fair. Yeah, and yeah. I, so I think that it's hard to bring a lot to a character like that. And yeah, it, given that, I think she did a pretty good job. Actually, I do also like the fact she did. Uh, she was almost kind of smirking. At Bill Murray, mm-hmm. which was nice. Like, even when she was kind of pissed at him, she was kind of still, like... You could tell that there was, like, a spark. Like, there was, right. like... There was an attraction that she was just like, oh, you were so close, but no. Nope. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, she sees what he's trying to do. Yeah. 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 Well, and that maybe that's part of, you know, sometimes the thing... It's like, for me, a, a, a film, for instance, that could have been good... Ah, oh, right. It's more frustrating than yeah. just a oh, horrible yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. Right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think she feels that way about Bill Murray. Like, right. this guy could be it. okay. But it is, it's a movie that appeals to, I think, everybody. I don't, it I, really does. I don't know of anybody who doesn't like Groundhog Day. Well, you know, there's an interesting thing about Now, I don't know anybody. I'm sure there's somebody out there. Oh, I hate, you know, they probably hate Bill Murray or something. But, you know, it's funny, this idea of a, of a target audience which I think is the, almost one of the worst things that happened to that and having video people direct uh, movies because they don't know anything about drama. Um, but uh, this idea of a target audience, when marketing people sort of took over uh, the movie business in a lot of ways, I think that they started thinking about target audiences and forgetting that you could make something for a general audience. And that didn't mean rated G. That just meant a lot of people could like this, you know. Um, in the old days of movies, that's what they did. They made things for a general audience. They made good movies. They, they just, made better They movies. wanted to make a good movie. They weren't yeah. trying yeah. to appeal to yeah. teenage boys. Or... Right. And I think that what that does, that thinking about a demographic, only makes you appeal to that demographic in the most sort of base ways. You know, so what do women this age to this age like? Give them that. Nothing else. Vampires. Don't give them, yeah. Nothing, <laughs> don't give them anything else. No depth. No nothing. Right. What do, what do teenage boys want? Give them that. You know, guns, explosions, scantily clad chicks. Give them that. You know what I mean? It's kind of this weird thing that makes, I think, really what, bad art. I think art. what every audience wants is, is a good movie with a good story. They yeah. want a good story. They want to be entertained. Yeah. They don't want to be talked down to. No, they don't. Um, but you can make a lot of money. You know, I mean, I think it's been about a, it's been a generation and a half or so where people have been um, catered to this way. And so I don't think they know anything else. Right. Um, so they go, well, that's what movies are. They're this, you know, for a, a teenage boy. It's like a movie is a video game. They don't know that. It, you right. Know. You can't take a whole family to see a movie and have them all enjoy it. No. No. Yeah. It's maybe it's, for like maybe a, like a Pixar movie. Like yeah. Those, yeah. T- yeah. Those, those yeah. are some of the only movies that tend to appeal to everybody. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I don't think, I mean, from, you know, I've worked with them a little bit and I, I've never heard anybody talk about making a movie for kids or making a movie for adults or making a movie for everybody. They just try to make the best movie they can. Yeah. And, I think, and, and it works for them. Yeah. yeah. And you can feel that when you watch it. Yeah. Like, it's just... Oh, this is good, solid entertainment. It's a good... Well, it starts with a good story. Yeah. Then that's what you need. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, that's all they talk about when I'm there, a story. They don't talk about art. They don't talk about... Well, they know they can do the animation. Yeah. They've proved that. Yeah. Um, Have they? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, know a co- I know a couple of animators there and other people in the story, story department, story boards, really. But um, uh, all I've ever heard anybody talk about is story. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure they talk about other things, but I've never heard it. Thanks for joining us, Brian. And sure. uh, so where can people find out more about you? More about me. Yes. Uh, they can go to uh, my blog, the uh, Invisible Ink blog. You can look that up. 
It's not hard to find, I don't think. And uh, they can uh, they can read my books. Um, uh, what are they? The Invisible Ink. The Invisible Ink. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what are your books? I don't read my books. I write them and then I don't read them. Huh. So, uh, it's like you've read them. Hmm? It's like you've read them. It's like I've read them. I was really the first person to read them. Really. <laughs> uh, so, Invisible Ink, Golden Theme, uh, Ink Spots, and Freeman are my books. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Honest Tea and Hilliard's Beer. Delicious drinks. We had them as our sponsors at the uh, 2020 Awards ceremony this year. And uh, I have to say, I got very hooked on the Honest Tea. And uh, and, the, and the Hilliard's Beer ain't bad either. I'm drinking and, it right uh, now. Well, we're drinking it right now. So uh, if you're a movie lover and would like to support us, you can subscribe to the 2020 Film Club. Your annual subscription gets you into 10 of our monthly for your consideration screenings here in Seattle. And a ticket to our annual ceremony in February, plus lots of other little perks. It's over $100 value for only $40. To enroll, just visit us at 2020awards.org and look for the subscriber link. Uh, And that's where you can find out more about us, too. So uh, until next time, remember, it's never too late to start thinking about the past.